I like repeat this to anybody who asks me, like, how do I get into it? And I, I was like, you just have to make things. Like producing work on whatever form is kind of what informs the world and what you do. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. Today, I'm talking to Willow Perron. Willow is a founding principal of Perron Rodinger, a multidisciplinary studio specializing in live events, print design, interior space, and holistic campaign strategies. He got his start in Montreal's DIY scene, promoting club nights at local venues, designing shoes and streetwear. His big break came in the early 2000s when he created the American Apparel Store's iconic aesthetic. Since then, he's put a flying car over a Drake crowd, conceived an expansive invoking of the natural world for Florence and the Machine, and collaborated with, you know, Jay-Z, Rihanna, Kanye West, Drake, Tame Impala, Migos, Frank Ocean, The XX, and Lady Gaga as part of Perone Rodinger. He's even won a Grammy for his work on St. Vincent's Mass Education album packaging. A French-Canadian pop polymath, designer, creative, collaborator, and pioneer. Here's Willow. Willow, and last name is Perron. I live and work in Los Angeles, California. I'm designer, director, I guess. And yeah, I run a studio here with a bunch of talented designers. That sounds dreamy, hanging out with a bunch of talented designers all day, making things happen. But before we get to what you do in this day, I would love to go all the way back to the beginning. I'm always interested in learning about the formative years. So can you tell me about where you were born, what your family was like, and what kind of kid you were? <laughs> born in Montreal. Pretty much everybody in my family has a creative pursuit of some sort. Most of them do it as a career. My father was a jazz pianist, so grew up obviously around a lot of music. My mom also plays piano and sings and paints and does a lot of things. She's a psychologist, a bit like new wave, new agey. And then, yeah, I have like aunts and uncles that are all, you know, musicians and painters and set designers and my brother's an architect, interior designer, very kind of like rich in uh, the liberty to, to kind of have an artistic pursuit, whether it was for a career or just as a hobby. That sounds kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. So I'm imagining there was a lot of, well, singing and piano, but like what were holidays and birthdays like or like downtime with the whole family? You know, we're, we're from pretty humble means. I mean, I, I grew up actually fairly poor, but, you know, everybody's done well for themselves. Family's always been a very kind of like humble. So it's it's kind of a idealized version of sort of like these sort of Christmases where people are like at the piano singing and, and all that. But imagine that in sort of like working class settings versus uh, the kind of Norman Rockwell Americana version with equal amounts of dysfunctionality and, and sort of like realism involved also. <laughs> that helps. Thank you for adding in the... Yeah, no, no matching sweaters, no... Uh, <laughs> a lot of like weird uncles. And... Yeah, I mean, did you have weird uncles and eccentric aunts and, and extended family that were, you know, part of the jazz culture that your dad was a part of and people coming through that had various creative perspectives that were kind of always influencing the things you got to witness? You know, we grew up in very immigrant neighborhoods, you know, first-gen immigrant neighborhoods. And my parents, like what people sort of consider liberal in, in America, which is kind of pretty base in where I grew up, my parents were kind of on the extreme end of that. My father was pretty, like, experimental. You know, my mom was like this hyper kind of like tolerant or is this hyper tolerant person. And and so like there, there was really kind of a mix 
of people in our house all the time. <laughs> it wasn't until I moved to California that I like, really understood cultural, social, political kind of segregation. I thought that that was an exaggeration. It was like something that was made up or fictional. I even thought that like the kind of like extreme racism was like s s events that were blown out of proportions until I moved here and like really understood that it was an actual part of like day-to-day -day life here. Despite the fact that we were poor, it was like Montreal was pretty idealistic. We, me and my brother went to, to a public art school that was incredible. So, I mean, for context, when, when were you born? Like what era are we Nin talking about? 1973. I'm having trouble even picturing the jazz scene in the 1970s, but I, I'm guessing it's clubs, right? Clubs and records and... Yeah, I think that... 70s is experimental, you know, it's a lot of synths and, and kind of free jazz. And my father, you know, right before we were born, played with uh, Sonny Rollins. He was like Sonny Rollins' pianist. Thank you for placing this for me. Yeah. yeah f totally free, kind of like experimental. And I think when you get into sort of like right our childhood, you're dealing with kind of when jazz and world music and like you know miles davis wears like shiny jackets and wrap around shades and yeah <laughs> i'm it, with you i'm his with you trumpets are like you know anodized purple metal and you know it gets a bit and more herbie flamboyant. hancock yeah it gets more flamboyant and mainstream and so growing up in a creative family, you didn't have to fight for your, your right to be creative. Did you have to distinguish yourself amongst all the different flavors of creativity that you were steeped in? No. I think me and my brother really looked from an early age, picked our lanes, that despite the fact that we grew up in the same household and, and with the same values and everything, we have kind of a very different aesthetic. Besides that, no, I'm I'm kind of like it's the opposite. I'm like I'm like the commercial person in our family. You know? <laughs> I'm like the, the one who is like you know went out and like wanted to have a big career that was that was commercially successful, and and so I'm like kind of the you know I'm like teetering on the sellout in my family. Oh, isn't that interesting? You said you and your brother picked your lanes pretty early. Like, what were those lanes? And how were you expressing your creativity, like, by the time you hit your teenage years? Me and my brother only, like, a year and a half apart. I'm younger. It's kind of a, a strange time. You know, if you, if you look at my coming of age, I'm 13 in 1986. I'm 13. This is, like, skateboarding, and it's that it's like infancy and rap at its infancy and hardcore at its infancy and MTV, electronic music and all of this stuff that like had been bubbling up is now kind of starting to hit kind of its mainstream stride. And my brother was kind of like the generation right before, despite the fact. So he's kind of like the leather perfecto and rockabilly hair and mm. listening to like Cabaret Voltaire and, and uh, The Cure. And it's like kind of pretty boy. But it's like literally like it's months apart. You know, like his friends all wanted to look like James Dean and Morrissey. And, and then my friends all wanted to look like ad rock or you know yeah. like natus copus or like some pro skateboarder or something like that from like early on it's like we had kind of like different closets different groups of friends it wasn't until much later that we start to sort of like cross paths again but we've always been friends and but we definitely kind of trafficked in different environments did that mean sibling rivalry did that mean a kind of distance or did that mean like collaboration but from different perspectives or yeah how did that like manifest in your relationship i think all of those things there's always this sort of like romanticized idea of like doing things together as much as like there's conflicts in doing things as much as uh we admire each other's work and and kind of our practices but i couldn't work like he does and vice versa. And 
Your mom being a psychologist, did you feel like cases or clients? And also, did did you feel an acceptance for it? Sounds like you and your brother had kind of different personality types. I can see that some parents just get flustered when their children are so different from each other, because it's just a lot more work, I would imagine, to nurture different personalities. But with a background in psychology, maybe that demystified it a little bit. My friends and I talk about this a lot. Like, I dropped out of high school pretty young. Like, I think I was 14. It was like, okay. You know, there was like a bit of a struggle. And it was it, it was definitely like, are you sure about this? And like, blah, blah, blah. But it was like supportive. You know, it was like, I get it. Like, I just really hated being in school. I felt like it was a waste of my time. And Oh, can we unpack that a little bit? Were you not being challenged? Not challenged in the ways that I was excited about. I found myself getting into books and, and studying by myself and topics that I was interested in. And, and I was more interested in, in culture and, and music and the goings on of the world than I was about getting deeper into chemistry. And I don't know, I just really felt bored and unchallenged. And like, I felt like I, my life hadn't begun till I left there. And your parents supported it. That is the exact opposite of what I would have gotten from my parents. <laughs> it, it's not so much supported as they accepted it. There was some rules around me leaving, which involved like I had to do something, I had to work. I had to, it couldn't be just like you're quitting school to just like bum around and like skateboard with your friends all day. Sure, but it sounds like underscoring that is a bit of trust. They, they they trusted your decision and they trusted you to make something of your life without necessarily having to follow the prescriptive protocol of school. Yeah, 100%. I think like my mom really understood that I was going to stubbornly follow my own path. So <laughs> yeah. I was just like, do you want to fight this? The fight would have been lost, like for sure. So what did you do at 14 then? Where did you start working? And like, did you have the maturity? I mean, you were still living at home? Yeah, for, for not much longer. I think probably a couple more years at home. Probably till 17 was just like odds and ends, like just trying to figure out how the thing works. And then I started doing a bunch of things around the stuff that I liked, which was I was going out, out a lot. And like nightclubs were really interesting to me. And it was a moment in time where there was a, like a lot of pageantry to going out. This is going to be the early 90s, right? So this is... Yeah, this is late, late 80s, early 90s. I'm, I'm like, you know, 16, 17 years old. I'm going to clubs. So this and, is Club Kids. Yeah, it's like right before rave. It's kind of like Club Kids. All the gay clubs are super interesting. Rap doesn't play anywhere. You can only go see like rap shows in like high school basements and things like that. Or like maybe across the border in the US. Yeah, even that like club owners were really apprehensive about putting on rap shows. It was like kept at bay. The gay clubs were really cool. House music and kind of like early techno was like super interesting and and like the costuming and everything that went into that. Yeah, I just, I would like bounce around from sort of like subculture to subculture and just be like, soak it all in. And then I started kind of throwing club nights. And there was a lot of things that I liked that didn't quite exist. One being there wasn't good rap shows or rap nights, you know, and maybe a little bit more in the States, but and same thing, like rave also started to kind of like bubble up and and we would see like things happening in London and on the West Coast in the States and, and like the drug culture change. It went from sort of like 80s kind of cocaine culture and like super kind of elitist door policies and like that kind of stuff to kind of like ecstasy, summer of love. 2.0, if you will. Yeah, yeah. You know, all that was super exciting to me. So as you're, you're describing this to me, I'm getting this picture of you being kind of an industrious sponge of life. Like you're not floating around aimlessly trying to figure out what to do with your life. You're actually really absorbing the culture. And if you started doing club shows, 
it sounds like there was an industrious kind of undercurrent or entrepreneurial angle to all of this. And so is that accurate, would you say? Yeah, yeah, 100%. I like repeat this to anybody who asks me like how I started or what do I, you know, how do I get into? And I, I was like, you just have to make things like producing work on whatever form is kind of what informs the world and what you do you can theorize about things and be hypothetical and be like i can make these great things but if there's not a first step into anything nobody really knows what you do and and i think that a lot of my work was informed by entrepreneurial decisions like oh, I'll make this club night. Then I have to like design a flyer and kind of do the lighting and make sure that like the right DJs are there and like the right kids are there. You know, you're setting the scene for like guy who does big concert tours, you know, 20 years later. <laughs> They're the same kind of tools. It's sort of like also the DIY of the punk era 2.0. I feel like that's a little bit later, no? We're still kind of late 80s, early 90s. We're still like in punk. Like we're still in like first gen. But like I remember going to see like asexuals and PIL and with my skateboard in my hand, like then going to like a, you know, rap show and like going to see it. I guess my point is punk really has this feeling of like, we can make our own records, we can make our own choices about the music we play, we can find our own venues and just do it. And we don't need necessarily rules, we'll just do it ourselves. And then 2.0 kind of feels more produced, a little more curated, a little more technically savvy, a little more culturally astute, less like fuck the man and more like, hey, let's cater to a kind of scene. If you really think about it, like all musical genres kind of have that moment, the, the sort of like the DIY moment and the kind of industrializing moment. Warehouse parties, like we would throw warehouse parties in literal abandoned warehouse. I know, it's so fun. I miss those days. <laughs> yeah, they would just like go until the cops shut them down. Nobody would get arrested. Nobody would get a fund. They'd just be like, move along. So as you're doing this, are you learning what it is you really enjoy about it? And, and what is it? Is it the creation of the experience? No, I think I'm probably reactionary to in my mid-30s, probably even later. I'm just like reacting to things that I like and trying to bring them into my circle. And whether it's through knowing the people that are making the things that I like or to like hosting or to developing them myself or I'm just I think I'm just like reacting to being in this sort of like collective conscious or just like in the wave of whatever the moment was. So this is all still in Montreal at this point. Are you kind of a big fish in a small pond? Yeah, it gets it gets to that point. It, I we do everything from like club nights, start making clothes as open retail stores, I have a record shop. There's not much that you can kind of like export out of Montreal at this time. It's changed a lot since since then, but everything's very local. So it's very difficult to make like any sort of money. And and I think that I've, at this point, I've like kind of done everything that I can do there. It does become big fish, small pond. Does that have something to do with moving? Did that precipitate your move to California? I originally, so I, I would design for kind of local clothing companies in, in Montreal. One was like skate snowboard company. The other one was like a kind of a club streetwear brand. And I did both. Like <laughs> just to speak about like being industrious and, and kind of like motivated. I would do both of these brands simultaneously and throw club nights. And, you know, I was just like, couldn't be busy enough, you know? Some of them like started showing and kind of selling to shops in the States and kind of doing trade shows in the States and getting a little bit of attention. I started meeting people at like trade shows in California. And what trade shows were you going to? Like action sports retail? And yeah, stuff? exactly. Surprised you know this. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. ASR is pretty formative for a lot of people in like early skateboarding. And one of the people I met there by fluke was Damon Way, who owned DC Shoes. I don't really know. We stayed in touch. We, we became friends and he got word that I'd left the companies I was working with in Montreal and like opened a record shop and blah, blah, blah. 
And you just call me one day and he's like, hey, do you want to come run the clothing departments? DC had skateboard apparel brand called Drawers and they had a, a snowboard apparel brand called Dub. And he's like, do you want to come run Dub and Drawers? Yeah, so I just like moved. <laughs> <laughs> so I just moved to LA, did that for a few years. And really, I liked the challenge of the work, but I, I really hated LA. It made me really miserable. What year are we in now? 98. You know, it was like great because it was like, I just like meeting people every day. They were like legends that I like grew up like watching skate videos. And, you know, it was like insane. Like my first day of work was like Steve Rocco and <laughs> just like, it was just like crazy. It was just like, oh, I can't believe that these are my bosses or peers or they would like shoot skate videos in my warehouse. Yeah, it was just like this thing was just like felt surreal a little bit. And and at the time we had the best skate team and the best snowboard team. So it was just like all these guys would just hang out. And, and I think that that was the moment where I was like, oh, skateboarding and like streetwear is maybe not for me. It was like way too dude-ish. And it was like at the peak of sort of like blingy skateboarding too. So it was like bravado just like packs of dudes hanging out together which i'd never done like growing up in montreal it was just like hyper social and just kind of mixed i don't know this energy <laughs> and i'm curious about why you were miserable in la i have my theories i lived there for a long time but what would you say was the chief contributing factor to your misery there 98 in la nobody was on the streets I also made like a weird decision. I didn't really know the city, so I moved to the beach down south in the beach. And then, so it was like felt very desolate, and like socially and culturally not very interesting. And it, and I think that that era is probably the low point of LA. You know, everybody was living behind gates and people were afraid to be in the streets and there wasn't much synergy in neighborhoods and yeah. And not only that, but there were pockets of flavor. But if you weren't in one of those pockets, it was really inconvenient to get to one and to explore it and discover it and become part of it. And this is also like right before people had cell phones. So it's just like you could ruin your whole night by just missing meeting somebody at a street corner like, yeah, and then totally. be like across the city and like drive back to you know yeah. just, and for me like growing up in kind of a small cosmopolitan city where it's just like you know everybody you like you could like go to a club by yourself and run into 50 people and that leads you to another thing and leads you to another thing and they're like these every night was an adventure to like every night just kind of ended as a dud here and I don't know. It was just like, felt very blah. But you're back in LA now. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so let, I left. Yeah. Went to New Connect York. Connect the dots for me. You went to New York in like 99 or so? Yeah. Was the art director for a record label called Raucous uh, for a few years, like 99 to end of 2001, basically. You know, that was like the polar opposite. It was like r super rich in out and about every night. And it's just like in museums and bookstores and just kind of like filling the, the void of, of what like L.A. had been for the last previous couple of years. Also, I knew a bunch of people in New York, which I didn't know anybody in L.A. So it was felt like m much more interesting. And I also worked for a record label that I was like a big fan of which was another kind of happenstance story of like somebody just kind of calling me one day and, and being like, hey, you know, New York for a few years until... Sounds like you never had to hustle for a job. You were just out doing what you were doing and people were taking notice. And then eventually when they needed somebody like you, they'd call you up. Which goes back to just like make stuff. Because there's no reason, especially now where the mediums are so easy... There's no barrier for entry in doing 3D or graphics or music or photography. Or, you don't need anything. You have it. Everybody has it in their, their pockets or their laptop. Or, it doesn't need a mandate to make things. Right. Nobody mm -hmm. needs to give you permission to make something. You just need to make it. Yeah, you can just like world build on social and 
it's super easy. There's no cost involved. How were the raucous years um, formative for you? And it sounds like maybe it was also a little more community centered than LA and maybe a little less dudish. Yeah, I mean, rap's pretty dudish, but it was like the city wasn't dudish. You know, you weren't, you weren't like segregated in your little pocket of like the people that you see. Yeah, the city was just like great and alive. And I don't know, it was the, the whole thing was super fun. Like sort of independent rap is was now like underdog that it, it, it had like gotten attention and on the back of kind of the New York basketball jersey golden era of rap was like this this kind of little brother that came in and just did like all this interesting thing and most f and quali and eminem and kanye and all those people kind of come out from that era of sort of like lyricists and it was like a little bit more intellectual it was like less bravado I don't know, it was super interesting. It was like a sort of the confluence of like skateboarding and rap. Like these are all things that I was very familiar with and kind of they were all just starting to kind of merge together. And even like electronic music was like kind of seeing kind of like a little bit of cross-pollination in there. And I don't know, it was super fun and challenging. Yeah, I stayed there till basically till post-September 11th, which... Oh, yeah, that thing. I'm fortunate that I wasn't actually in the city that day, but I was actually out in LA and on my way back from Asia or something. And, and I was like, I'm maybe not going to go back to New York. Maybe I'll just go to Montreal. And I can hang out with my brother. And all of my friends in, in Manhattan were like, where are you? I was like heading to Montreal. It was just like a bunch of my friends just drove up. To Montreal and like stayed in my house for a while or my brother's house and so it was just like New Yorkers camping out in Montreal till like everybody kind of got their bearings a little bit. It sounds like they needed a place to galvanize and sort of reaffirm community. Yeah it was also like we've just gone through one of these events where nobody knows in real time what's happening so it's like everybody's familiar with the feeling of like this horrible thing happens and you're like you don't know if that's just the beginning of more horrible things right so everybody was just like trying to figure out how to distance themselves from this as much as possible and i think that the handful of friends that were in new york that okay montreal seems like easy and far enough kind of not involved in this at all so Canada did feel safer than the U.S. at that oh, time. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Still does. How long did you hunker down and what did the sort of, you know, recalibration look like? I, like, decided to just get a place there. I, I like, I kind of never went back to New York. I'd gone back. And, you know, I still had my place. I still had an apartment in New York. But I went back. I don't know. I felt, like, super grim. And also my visa had expired and it was just like, you know, I had to like go through military checkpoints to get to my apartment. And I have the option to not be here. Let's not be here. And so I just got a place in Montreal and I just wound up staying there for a while. The funny thing is all through this, all through being in California and in New York, I still had the stores, I had some shops in Montreal. I just kind of went back to the guy who has some shops in Montreal. <laughs> just like kind of did that for a little while. Did you have any like psychological processing to do? You, you'd been through a lot of change in a short period of time. And then 9-11 is no small thing. I have no connection to 9-11. Despite being a New Yorker at that time, I wasn't there in this sort of post 9-11. I just stayed away and I took some time to go back and then when I went back it just felt like a bit brutal to me and I was like I don't need to live in this dystopic film I'm not from there and granted like America's been like super generous to me and and let me do a lot of things but I, I don't feel American ever it's my second home despite the fact that I like, live here live here and I, I have a have a home here of nature it doesn't feel like my home home which is a weird thing to say but that's probably why i don't have a difficult time kind of uprooting myself and, and being like okay that was great and it did what it needed to do 
So after going back to Montreal and being a guy with some shops there for a while, <laughs> like we need to get to the place where you found your own studio. Connect the dots for me. How did you get to the place where you founded Willow Perrin and Associates, which is now Perrin Rodinger? In Montreal, took a little storefront and continued doing design work as as a you know freelancer or a small agency, and that's kind of the inception of that it wasn't really branded didn't really have it was like me and a couple of my friends and um, my brother intermittently because he was still studying from there we just did design projects for a bunch of people kind of everything from local to not and one day by another kind of like <laughs> fluke i feel like it's just say willow's life is just a bunch of flukes I think there's something to that, though. I think when you have, like, when you live with a kind of creative intention. Yeah, it just comes to you. Yeah, the path unfolds in front of you. I think sometimes yeah. we, we make it harder than it needs to be. I know I do, or I have, um, trying to undo that. So I love hearing stories like this, where you kind of just stayed in your interest and stayed connected to it and kept making things. And then, you know, opportunities kind of kept coming in front of you and you chose the ones you wanted to do. And I think if you force opportunity to, it's just a, that gets messy a little bit too. Some people are really good at just like speeding up the process. I, I always kind of have faith in things kind of showing up when they're supposed to show up. I like that. But yeah, so Dove, Charney, who uh, at this point was early American apparel as this consumer facing brand like he'd been making t-shirts and stuff for the imprintables market and and we knew each other from way back like he was just a kid around montreal you know he's a, a tiny bit older than me but we had a bunch of friends in common and he walks into the studio which was just like this little storefront and he's like what is this who are you guys <laughs> my, my i can see this i want a movie of this <laughs> yeah my chair was kind of back to the front door. So I turn around and he's like, ah, Willow. He's like, had to be you. He's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, well, I got these stores. So we walked around and looked at the stores. And I was like, actually, a couple of our stores sell your blanks, but we can. it's just such a mess. We can never get enough. They just sell out. He's like, let's go to the warehouse. And we just like pack up some of the stores with, with American Apparel blanks. And they sell out as always. And he's like, let's open a store next door because there was an empty, there was a space for rent next door to one of my stores. And that's the first American Apparel store. Wow. Which is in Montreal. And it's like, you know, me and my brother worked on it. Like Dove's dad worked on it. It was like a kind of a funny mix of people. People don't line up for shit in Montreal and there's no fanfare for anything. And this was that. Wow. Which was like, you, you're talking about like a very difficult customer and for it to be received in that way was like, okay, there's something here. I spent the next three, four years of my life kind of on the road, building stores, finding locations, staffing kids, <laughs> designing stores, getting, you know, permits, not getting permits. God knows how many of these we built, but I was like on a plane every couple of days across the planet and doing that thing for Dove and American Apparel, but like independently still, still working on like other design projects, but like that consumed like 90% of my life. And I would kind of almost never set foot in Montreal. I'd be on the road and then like get an apartment for six months and southern american states and stay there and just like build a bunch of stuff around there and then like go to korea and do the same and you know, none of us knew what we were doing interesting learning curve in real time but i think all of us were too stubborn to admit that we didn't know what we were doing so <laughs> we sort of kind of figured it out kind of an interesting like super important kind of moment in time like i feel like i meet people all the time were doing incredible things that their first job was American Apparel. And you're like, oh, you didn't have an option when you were a teenager. It definitely was kind of seismic on both the fashion and retail fronts, you know, and, and in many ways, because it was revolutionary that t-shirt blanks could be so mm -hmm. important. But it was also revolutionary, the, the work you did with the retail stores, because they seemed hyper cool, but not super like corporate which 
was a very important space to occupy. It's particularly at that moment in time. Yeah, it's like right post gap. And it's like, feels a bit punk. You know, it's like, how do you do hundreds of stores and they still feel like rebellious and messy? And like, the reason that it didn't sustain, I mean, is because it never kind of optimized. There's a point where you can be like big idea, you can synergize culture and, you know, get everybody kind of on board. And, and at a point it has to become like somewhat practical, you know? And it, right, and, and right. I, I don't think Dove ever wanted for it to just like feel corporate and get organized. And, I'm interested in this space where it's possible that what made it so special and what made it skyrocket to the top was also kind of an unsustainable vibe, one that couldn't last or translate. You look at like whatever we're into, it's teenager that's just like, you know, stay out all night, like eat a bunch of drugs. It's like, there's a point where you're like, okay, like that's super fun, but you're going to die if you keep doing this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or junk food or whatever. It's just like your luck's going to run out at some point. And I sort of remember a distinct moment where the partying was kind of wasn't as fun. It was a little more work <laughs> than, it, than it used to be. <laughs> you weren't guaranteed a good time. And then it was like, let me maybe ground myself in something a little more nutritious. <laughs> yeah, you realize that like, you know, the way that you looked at older people when you were younger, you're like, oh, that's why. <laughs> So, I mean, this also sounds kind of like a hard life traveling for three to four years, you know, with the rapid expansion of these American apparel stores. Was this the beginning of your, your studio? After leaving American Apparel, I actually moved to L.A. because I was burnt out. I just came here and visited a friend and he lived in like a nice part. You know, I was like in my early 30s, felt very serene. I was like, I'm just going to hang out here for a bit. Got recruited by Apple, went over there for a little bit, wasn't really my speed. Left there, went traveling for a little while and met Kanye when I was traveling. How does one meet Kanye while traveling? So the record store I had in Montreal, we then built a small record label and the club nights and stuff, there, there was a DJ called A-Track. I owned the label with him, and he was like one of the resident DJs at my club nights. And then won the DMC World Championships, and it becomes sort of like on the world stage a little bit, and then had become Kanye's tour DJ. I was, you know, in Southeast Asia and saw that they were playing somewhere, and I called them, and we just met up and went to the show and he introduced me to Kanye who wasn't hugely popular at this point it was like known but like underground -y. like he had a couple records I think like he had Workout Plan and Jesus Walks which seemed both really big at this point but like he could walk around the streets anywhere it'd be fine like he wasn't mega famous Kanye yeah, and we just got along. I don't know. We just like met up, got along, and started working together from that point on. And we actually, when we all got back to L.A., we actually set up a design studio with him, which was the formation of Donda, Yeezy, all of that stuff that exists now, was we had this little design studio, which was six, eight of us, just like working on concepts and tour and everything else that needed to be done. Did that feel to you like your your next chapter you were going to be immersing yourself in? Because it sounds like after American Apparel, you were kind of a free agent. I was doing stuff, but I decided to take some time off. Yeah, it just like, again, it kind of happened and serendipitously and we started kind of cranking away on things. One thing led to another and, you know, we were just super busy working on everything from clothing to Grammy performances to tours to, and then his first big tour, which was Glow in the Dark, which I worked on. Yeah, and it was just kind of like a new challenge, a new medium, a new sort of way of communicating. And there was no such thing as kind of creative directors for artists, but at that time there was, you know, the record label with, suggest photographers and like a web designer and then you would just get like hit up by like your agent or six different sides and 
And I think what's interesting about me and Ye's relationship was we we're like, let's take all of this back from other people's hands and like really dictate our own visual outcome. We just built the team around them. And like, I just hired people, some of which are still around. It sounds so intuitive when I think about it. I, I remember that, you know, labels had control of everything and you sort of had to work with the people that they suggested. And it was this piecemeal cobbling together of whatever your representation to the public was going to be. Mm -hmm. Like pulling it in house and having some oversight over it feels like, of course. It's funny because, you know, coming from kind of more conventional, you know, Apple, American Apparel, like doing sort of brands like clothing brands and where like everything's important, like, you know, the usage of like brand identity needs to be consistent, the sort of color palette. And then you would look at music acts and it'd be like all over the place because like this company would do the website and the website didn't look at all like the album packaging and the album packaging wouldn't look at all like the videos in comes also social media at this point and kind of blogs and and so the like the communication from artists goes from early days which is an album cover and a couple of videos maybe a tour to a bunch of tv performances a bunch of videos a bunch of social media content a bunch of blog content album packaging and the reality of having like teams around successful artists and to have somebody to sort of like guide a consistent through line was like the most important thing and and that's the kind of the advent of the sort of the creative director for musicians like i don't think that like that had ever been kind of treated that way before that kind of life-changing for me i think life-changing for Kanye to kind of influence kind of everybody else to do the same. I kind of wound up in that for Gaga and for Rihanna and just like a bunch of other people. That's kind of the inception of the office is kind of, I start kind of doing multiple acts at the same time. You work across many fields. You do these live experiences, concert performances and things, but you also do interior, more retail, as well as identity and print. So I love that you've never pigeonholed or specialized. You still get to be that absorbent sponge that gets to go wherever you're interested in. And then you get to wring yourself out <laughs> into this work. I think that I did really immersed sort of creative with musicians for you know the better part of the last 15 years and i think that you have to be totally immersed to do it well like you have to like live the person that you're working with and like taking handfuls of drugs at raves or eating junk food every day there's sort of an expiry date on like how much of that you can do you know because you sacrifice yourself you know your your life goes into the work yeah, you can't really like have your own life if you're also immersed and embedded. A lot of 4 or 5 a.m. phone calls and a lot of like, hey, we're going flying across the world today and a lot, a lot of that consistently. And you have to also, you know, imagine like, you know, all the creative that goes into doing a lot of these people is that's one person's job is maybe one person and to decide that you're going to do that for four or five people was just like a test of like will and a resilience you know to do like go from like Kanye to Drake to Rihanna to Gaga I'd literally leave one and just go into the other world like constantly did you lose your bearings that's also not real those those people don't live regular lives so like how did you keep your sense of center I don't know. It's beautiful. It's dream. You realize that the world has parallels. You know, not everybody has to live the same way to achieve something. And it's incredible to achieve success in artistry and uncompromising. And I don't think there's anything better. It's also like tormenting, but <laughs> I, I think that probably the most incredible thing. It's incredible to just like go sort of like 
skip from kind of one kind of like totally dream fictional world to another that in part I created and other people created and just like you want more of it but again it's like sugar or anything you can kind of have so much of it I'm really interested in this idea of parallels I can see that but I can also see that you're almost like an embedded journalist as well, like needing to immerse yourself so deeply in the ethos and values and creative culture of this movement character or brand that you're creating for. I think embedded journalists is, seems really passive in its observation. I think it's like feels more like coach or something like that. Like you're in the game. You know, you're not observing the game. You've anteed into this, but you have to kind of observe everybody's movements and what they mean, what the ripples are. And, but you also have to be able to sort of like criticize the thing from an outside perspective. Yeah, you're not just observing in order to report back. You hold an actual active influential part in the whole scheme. Yeah, like Connie always referred to like Tyson's trainer as that kind of thing where it just like helped him formulate his idea and get him structured. Okay. You're, you're, um, you're in the ring with them. Yeah. Not quite in the ring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it takes a lot of will and courage to go stand in front of people and like put your guts out there. And there's great rewards and great, criticism and attacks, you know, that come from both of those things. And I admired those people tremendously. I don't do it, you know, like I put my work out there and it, but it's kind of easy for me to like skate out of it if I really needed to. And the person that stands on the front line is, takes a tremendous amount of courage to do your thing in front of, you know, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, millions, like it doesn't matter. It does take a, a tremendous amount of courage. I can imagine that you might feel, if you're creating a supportive landscape and environment for that art, that is part and parcel of the art, I can see how you'd feel not only invested in the collaboration and the totality of the work, but also really invested in how your contribution might really engage the audience in the whole experience and the whole ambiance of it? My thing was just to make it kind of be a better version of itself. Find the strong points and, and make those stronger and take the weaknesses and try and remove those. And if things work, it's like, what, what about that thing that worked? Like, let's study that. And it's game tapes from somebody who's kind of a, a profound love for art and design and music that can kind of knows what the other game tapes are. What What is the most satisfying aspect of this work for you? When it works. When, like, all your theories kind of take shape and it works. Do you ever feel, I don't know, a kind of post-project vacancy? <laughs> like a what-do-I-do-with-myself kind of space? Like, all of this type of stuff started to happen. I was already in my 30s. I wasn't like a kid. You know, I wasn't the full grown up either, but I wasn't like a, this sort of idea of like crash and burn or doing too much. I, I knew that. So I always had kind of a step out of this. I was like, okay, this will this will button up at some point. This is not what you anchor your life into 100%. This could be a moment in your life. And so I just kept on working on other stuff too. You know, wasn't just this. It did get to a point where it has just gotten to a point where I'm just like, okay, I'll do a bit of music and selectively so, and I can't do the completely immersed version of it. I can do parts of it to be able to have like a, an existence and, and a practice of my own. Yes. And do you have a life of your own? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do. Because <laughs> I'm worried about you, you know, because you really did give yourself over in your 30s. I want to make sure that oh, you... Oh, yeah, no, my whole life. I used to, like, sleep under my desk. That's not something to be worried about. I think that it was something that was like, man, I hope that people find that much passion for something that they just, that's all they want to do. I'm sure, like, how prolific Picasso was, <laughs> I'm sure also 
would have been canceled at this point, but but like how prolific he was, he's just like wanted to work, you know, it's just like he, he sucked at everything else in his life, apparently, but he was <laughs> really good at, at like Warhol, like they just like worked and just like did that and like lived the work and, and not that I'm either one of those people, but you don't get to have that spot without working that hard. You know, I don't think that people understand it. Yeah, 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 talent, but you have to back it up with like a tremendous amount of conviction and hard work. It sounds to me like you have a kind of old soul wisdom where you recognized that this is the kind of thing I can do now um, while I'm young. I want to, so I'm going to give my, you know, I'm going to lean in and give everything mm-hmm. I've got to this chapter so that I can squeeze it for as much as I can get from it. But also kind of knowing that I don't need this to keep going for the rest of my life in order to validate my career. Like I, I can do this now. You know, the funny thing is I, I always really admire kind of like architects. And I feel like at least from my generation, now there's young, like superstar, everything that are like Doogie housering like every career but you didn't really get the big gigs if you will you had to kind of like earn your stripes and like i always thought of my career as something that would like start in like my 50s this first part was just like stripes you know i never really saw this as as like this is the career part like this is the preamble to the career and like maybe you know in the last three four years where We've set up a real kind of like studio and I mean, Brian Rolander kind of really kind of cemented this thing that it feels like a thing that's mine. Well, if uh, your career is going to start in your 50s, then this has all just been your education and you're you're about ready to get started. Right. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. I mean, which, which direction are you pointed in? <laughs> The last couple of years has been kind of leaning into making our own things, which is, you know, everything from furniture. We're about to publish our first book here. It comes out this month, I believe. Yeah, it comes out in a couple of weeks. What's, wait, what's the book? We're doing a book on a company called Parachute. It was like a fashion brand from the late 70s, early 80s. That was initially from Montreal and became kind of like the North American avant-garde, the way that, you know, Comme des Garçons was for Japan. This was for North America. And every big star at the time, from Michael Jackson to Peter Gabriel to David Bowie, wore a parachute. And then it just kind of went away. You know, fashion ebbs and flows and fades, and but they ebbed. <laughs> I don't know why, but really young, I was just like drawn to this place. There was, they had a couple shops in Montreal and it was like very progressive. It didn't feel like a clothing store. I would just like visit it. Like I didn't really have the means. I've also never been somebody that like dresses up as, I'm, I'm personally not very like peacocky, but I was just like very interested by the place. And every so often, like I would try and do a deep dive online to try and find information about what happened or just even photos online. And I had a folder on my desktop that just said parachute. And I would just like put things in it when I'd find them. Probably about a year ago, my brother called me and he was like, hey, do you remember this brand parachute? I was asked to do the exhibition design for a retrospective show about them. And then, you know, the museum asked us to design the book. And we were like, yes, absolutely. They couldn't quite find a publisher. And I was like, we'll just do it. This feels too, like, important for for us to just send it off to somebody who's going to do kind of a medium job at it. That's our first book that's coming out. I'm excited. I love your whole life story, Willow, and the way that you're incredibly industrious and entrepreneurial and deeply connected to your creativity, I can tell. But the way that opportunities kind of unfold for you defies conventional wisdom or conventional logic in a way that makes me believe a lot more in magic (laughs) in a good way. You know, not that you haven't cultivated relationships and a work ethic and 
proven yourself and you have a track record. Of course, these opportunities come in part because of that. But some of it also feels a little kismet, you know, and I think that your willingness to kind of trust that your life will unfold in a really interesting way and your commitment to following your interest is really beautiful. And I love that you've shared this story because I'm excited to share it with our listeners. My hope is that it it will inspire people to just start making. It's funny because I'm not very patient. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually quite impatient. But this is one of the things that I'm patient about. Like I really believe in, I don't know if it's karma or sort of like cosmic. Things are supposed to land where they land. You can swim upstream all day, but you're just exhausting yourself and you're just going to wind up exactly at the same place. If you plant seeds and you kind of nurture these things, not all of them are going to come to fruition. You know, like most of them aren't going to come to fruition. But if you plant a lot of seeds, there's probably more of it that's going to come to harvest. You know, and I, I think that that's kind of how I've played things always a little bit quieter i like to observe more than i like to talk you know let the the people that will find you are the right people i love that philosophy i'm going to incorporate that into, <laughs> into my own way of being this has been really beautiful i've really enjoyed this talk thank you my pleasure. thank you so much for sharing your story with me is, th is there anything that we haven't covered that you feel like is important to share Probably a lot, but... <laughs> Are there any secret talents or, or surprise skills that we should know about? I like not knowing things is, is one of my favorite places, you know, kind of the discovery. And, and that could be as much business as it's mediums and one to work or the idea of, of being able to kind of learn something new and kind of like immerse yourself to the point where you're great at it. It's kind of an interesting challenge, you know, it's, it's the same thing as you know, athletes go through or, you know, you just keep pushing yourself to figure out if you can kind of do more, or be better at something. And I think there <laughs> needs to be a little bit of that to be engaged. The moment you feel like you're an expert, then you kind of lose that curiosity that's required to keep you really actively paying attention. But the other thing is, is so many people are kind of daunted by not being an expert, by being a beginner or, or going into a space where they feel like they should know more than they do. And I think that's not serving them. Owning the discovery phase is an important thing to do that, that you've just kind of highlighted for all of us to think about. 100%. It's nobody's good at anything when they start. I mean, some people might have like a, a natural talent at running faster or hitting harder or whatever. Nobody's great when they start. Yeah, you have to kind of like be bad at something. It's good to be bad at shit, you know? I agree. But can you tell us one thing that you're bad at just so we can leave here feeling human? <laughs> I'm terrible at taking photos. Horrific. I don't know why. I just don't have it in me. I don't understand. I'm like admire people who are great cinematographers and filmmakers. I just don't have it in me. I kind of promised myself I would make a film in my life to just put myself through the hell of like being somewhat okay at something that I really suck at. <laughs> I'm not very good at like things that take a lot of like minutia and, and detail. And I, I like don't have the, the patience or bandwidth for it. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. I'm also a terrible photographer, so I feel I can relate to you now. We have something in common. It's almost comedy. Like there's fingers in a lot of like my <laughs> iPhone photos. Like I have to crop out my fingers. and It's terrible. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. My pleasure. Hey, thanks for listening. To see images of Willow's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would, please do us a favor and rate and review. It really does help. We also love chatting with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast and you can find me at Amy Devers. 
Clever is produced by 2BDE Media with editing by Rich Straffolino, production assistance from Ilana Nevins and Anushka Stefan, and music by L1011. 